Welcome everybody. Here we are to explore nature's intelligence. And um, I'm thrilled that we have people joining us from all over the world, you know, Europe, South America, North America, Australia. Uh, this is really great. Um, I wanna also do a shout out and thank some of our sponsors. If you could put up that card, that would be great. I'd like to just acknowledge all these groups. You know, typically sponsors are people who give you money, not in this situation. These are groups that have just joined us as part of this big mycelium network to be able to kind of spread the spores of wisdom. And it's been wonderful to build a global community around shifting consciousness, nature's intelligence, and trying to make the world a better place. So we can take that card down, which I would appreciate. Also want to thank all of the movie theaters who we've partnered with. When we had to leave the theaters because of the coronavirus, we have continued to have them be our partners. They've reached out to their communities and we have virtual cinema now with all these art house theaters, which need obviously community support. So we are sharing um, revenue from the virtual screenings of our movie. I've been heartened to see that Several of these cinemas are you know, donating revenue back to the community for the coronavirus uh, with feeding people. And um, again, we're, we're just doing what I think nature wants us to do, which is build community in order for ecosystems to flourish. This panel is gonna be about nature's intelligence. And I'm thrilled to have some of my favorite people in the world join me who are not only experts, but are deep friends. We have Suzanne Samard, who is a professor of forest ecology, teaches at the University of British Columbia. She's a biologist and she's tested the theories about the communication of trees. Her books, Hidden Life of Trees, How They Feel, How They Communicate, Discoveries of the Secret World, and also contributed with Fantastic Fungi. Um, she's really special and um, we're going to show a clip from the film where she shows us not only the feminine view of nature, but that trees actually take care of their young. Jay Harmon, he's joining us from Australia. Hello, Jay. He's a lover of the Australian bush and the oceans. He spent many years in conservation efforts. He's a naturalist and a biomimicry advocate who's created numerous companies about biomimicry inventions to show the industrial world how nature can solve humanity's most intractable challenges. Jay's the author of the book, The Shark's Paintbrush, How Nature is Inspiring Innovation, and the upcoming book, Capturing the Force of Nature. His company, Pax Scientific, is an incredible company that pioneers biomimicry, and he is the CEO of that. We're honored to also have Tioka Sin, Ghost Horse. Uh, he's a member of the Cheyenne River Lakota Nation of South Dakota. He's an international speaker on peace, indigenous and mother earth perspectives. He's also the host of First Voices Indigenous Radio and guest faculty at the Yale School of Divinity, Ecology and Forestry. And we have my dear friend, Paul Stamets, speaker, author, mycologist, medical researcher, entrepreneur, intellectual and industry leader on fungi, habitat, medicinal uses and production. His books include Mycelium Running, How Mushrooms Can Help Save the World, Growing Gourmet and Medicinal Mushrooms, Psilocybin Mushrooms of the World. And he's also the editor and contributor to our companion book, Fantastic Fungi, How Mushrooms Can Heal, Shift Consciousness and Save the Planet. So, I'd like to have you all think about this one big question. Um, let me get back here to nature's intelligence. Um, nature knows more than us. What can we learn from her? All the answers lie beneath our feet. How can we lose our human centric view and learn to live in harmony with the earth? I'm gonna start off with you, Suzanne, because you are so special to me. I know it's not easy for a woman to speculate that mother trees can care for their young, 
especially in a world that's dominated by male academics. Yet I'm so proud how you persevered and proved scientifically that they do communicate and nurture their young. I think I share with you the idea that I'm really tired of that old macho story of predator versus prey, survival of the fittest, killer be killed. I think for us, the grand and exciting story is the feminine view of nature, rebirth, regeneration, nurturing connections and relationships. That's one of the reasons why I made Wings of Life for Disney Nature, about pollinators, bees, bats, hummingbirds, and butterflies, getting it on the flowers, you know, a love story that feeds the earth, giving us the healthy food we need to eat. So right before I start with you, Suzanne, I'd love to be able to show the clip from the movie called The Mother Tree. A stick falls onto the ground, I pull it up, and there's my mycelium. It is virtually everywhere. A mycelium has more networks than our brain has neural pathways and works in much the same way with electrolytes, electrical pulses. They're the most common species on Earth. They're everywhere. Just to give you an idea of how much fungi are in the forest, as you're walking, there's about 300 miles of fungi under every footstep that you take, and that's all over the world. And they form these massive links. It's like a big web just growing through the forest. Mycelium that can grow out even just this big can have trillions, literally trillions of end branchings. Almost everyone knows about the computer internet. The mycelium shares the same network design. Trees are communicating using the mycelium as pathways. They're connecting one tree to another. They're using the mycelium too to feed one another. In other words, one tree can swap nutrients with another tree using mycelium as the passageway. recognition as an animal behavior. Humans, you know, we love our babies. We know it's our baby and we're gonna look after that baby. Well, we never thought that plants could do that, but we're finding in our research that plants can recognize their own kin. So these mother trees recognize their kin through their mycorrhizal networks. The mother tree and the baby seedlings are sending signals talking to each other. When they're connected together and carbon is moving between plants, the trees are supporting the weaker ones. If she knows that there's pests around and that she's under danger, she will increase her competitive environment towards her own babies so that they regenerate further away. It's a magical thing. And this could not happen without the fungi. Great, I think we're back. And that was an incredible journey underground, inspired by the incredible research that Suzanne did, putting radioactive isotopes in a tree and then tracking it across the valley to another tree, proving scientifically that there is a communication network under the ground, a shared economy where nutrients are shared for ecosystems to flourish. Suzanne Samard, tell us about your journey, what inspired you to do this, and um, what, what can we learn in terms of nature's intelligence from you? Thanks, Louis. Um, well, I, I grew up in forests where I am right now, which is in Western Canada near the Rocky Mountains. Um, and I, I was really just like a lot of kids just played in the forest and loved the trees. They were my friends. Um, and my brother and I were always building tree forts and all kinds of stuff like this. Um, and then I, you know, I wanted to study forestry because my, my family was a forestry family. Uh, my grandfather was a horse logger. Um, and when I went to forestry school, I was told that the trees were actually our enemies, <laughs> um, that we needed to get rid of trees, you know, cut them down. And especially certain ones that 
we're my friends, like the birches and the maples um, here in here in the in the West. And uh, and I started, you know, questioning that as a as a young as a young person, and eventually went and studied. You know, are really trees enemies of each other? Like, do they just you know sort of beat each other up through this competition? Um, and I started, like Louis said, I started tracing what they were actually uh, sharing between each other and whether they were taking things away from each other or giving it back. And I used isotopes to do that. And I labeled trees with different kinds of isotopes and just watched where they went. And it was the most fascinating thing. That, that's when I learned that, you know, that trees are all connected below ground by this wonderful mycelium, this um, through this beneficial cooperative relationship between certain kinds of fungi and trees, um, where the trees give carbon in return for nutrients, and these fungi link all the trees together. And they are kind of like the telephone lines, if you want to think of it that way, between the trees. And so the trees communicated with each other, between each other, through this big network. Um, and, you know, I went on and on and figured out what this network looked like. And it and when we actually rolled back the forest floor and took a look at it, it looked like the internet um, where there are hubs and links and it was blinking and, and there's all kinds of information going back and forth. And I thought this, this is completely different than what I was taught when I was learning how to be a forester, that trees don't just compete with each other, they actually collaborate and they collaborate to keep each other healthy and alive and a whole resilient forest. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, and and Suzanne, I mean, tell me. I, I think you did share with me that at first, being a woman, and and saying that you know, like a mother tree can care for its young. Yeah. I mean, what kind of resistance did you you know have to go through? But more importantly, how does that open up a different view of nature? That it's not all about kill or be killed and survival of the fittest. Yeah. Well, so there's. Um... You know, yeah, so I, you're right. Where, like my later experiments looked at how these old trees, they, these were sort of like the hubs of the network that we were able to see from our below ground maps of what that network looked like. And it really emerged out of that, that, that there were these big old trees that were like the key, the key players in the network, the ones that were the organizers. And so I started trying to figure out what they do. And, and I planted seedlings of different, um, genetic makeup around these old trees and realized that the old trees could tell which ones were their own from their own seed, which were their own kin, um, and that they nurtured them. And, and so eventually I started calling those mother trees because they were like they were mothering their own seedlings because they provided them with water and carbon and nutrients and information on how to stay healthy. You know, like information like, um, hey, there's a there's some something is um, affecting you're sick. You should, you should eat this carbon. Um, and so I started calling them mother trees and immediately, you know, uh, there was all, there's all kinds of people who don't like that. <laughs> so, um, because some people, you know, well, first let me say, most people love that idea because they can relate to it, right? Like, of course your mother is going to nurture you. And there are, like, there's the mother earth and we all, have this kind of a lot of people have this inner sense that those trees are nurturing and and that they're communicating with their young um and yeah i could say more about that but there was a lot of opposition to that term too for for one um there's a whole uh the trees themselves are mothers and fathers so there's some scientific disconnects there and I, I get that but I use that term because because of the feeling it invokes in people and they understand it so well and then on the other side you know a lot of men don't like that <laughs> term because they feel excluded and I get that too and it's not meant to exclude them at them at all or you know the, the male part of us it's not meant to be exclusive it's more meant to engender that feeling that trees are not that different than us in fact, we share most of their genes. They're our ancestors. Um, they, we come from them and our nurturing ability is learned from, from their genetic makeup. And, uh, and so it includes all of us. It's it, you know, male, female, mother, father, everything. And I think that people will, you know, you know, most people love the term because it just gives you that feeling that you, you, you know that, you know, it's a sense of knowledge, so. I would say overall the response has been very positive. That's great. 
Well, so um, Tiokasin, um, it, now that we're talking about this idea about this, you know, idea of, which maybe to the Western mind is weird, that a mother tree actually takes care of its kin, that uh, a forest isn't a bunch of trees, but is a community. I'm sure that indigenous people have understood that for a very long time. You know, I, I did a documentary special about climate change for discovery. It was called Oceans of Air back in 1992. It won an Emmy. And it filmed, I filmed it in Olympic National Park, Olympic Peninsula, because in the 50 square miles of Olympic Peninsula, you've got the four ecosystems. You've got coastal, you have rainforest, glacier, and rain shadow. And we used people's mythology in order to tell that story. The spiritual voice of the narrator was Kwati, which roughly translates into the changer. And I know you told me that in Lakota, there are only verbs, no nouns. And so can you share with us, you know, um, the way that you and indigenous cultures have looked at the intelligence of nature? Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Hello to everybody out there. Um, I, I'm gonna infuse my own little thoughts into what I need to say with uh, what Suzanne, going along with Suzanne saying, and it's the, the elder trees are the ones who um, support the life. We say this in a sense um, that if you, if you plant a bunch of trees that are all the same age, they have no elders. So there's no social order. They won't know how to grow. They'll be aggressive and sort of out of context with each other. So we always look to the elders in understanding um, how the community is shown to us. And this language that I'm speaking of, it's, it's one of many thousands. In fact, uh, indigenous languages are the majority languages in the world. And these languages all stem from the earth, they all originate from the earth. And so when Suzanne is describing the communication that goes on underneath us afoot in, in a way that we understand, uh, how do you say, is that to everything is coming from the consciousness. In other, in other words, we are uploading from the earth. So we understand the electricity, the communication that is going on there, but that's, that's how it, it in the ceremonies that we have, we've had that ongoing for centuries before 1492, so to speak. And we have endeavored to carry these, these on regardless of what, what policies or what conceptual mind thoughts are coming towards us from other cultures or other uh, nations. And so now is that consciousness that Suzanne is talking about. I know Paul has worked in with that all most of his life. And in the Northwest, it's plain to see and breathe and hear. When you're talking about um, relationship within this microcosm, macrocosm, we're in the language of Lakota, we, we're referring to uh, the, the cha, which is the trunk of the tree. The cha is, is basically how we view our trunks on our bodies, our torso. And so when you have that um, as your basis, we see that in every human male or female is a little bit of both of us. So a lot of indigenous peoples know that trees are, are, are both male and female because they exhibit both qualities and they, they can propagate, or, or excuse me, they can have a prosperity as always giving and dying at the same time. So they're really exchanging thoughts through the process of releasing air as you call it, we call it wonia, which is the breath of life. And, uh, and as, actually we give back to it. So that's why our expansion of our lungs in and out is the same process as the tree. You see, now we can, if we break it down in scientific terms, it seems to make sense. But I think it's the way that I'm explaining it in this language that tends to mythologize how we feel or express ourselves in our language. Right, because trees don't have concepts, human beings do, and so we always anthropocentricize, if that's the word, the forest and all those things that are outside of us, rather than thinking um, that the way I've, I've come to say is that our bodies are in the soul, rather than the soul being separate only in the body, 
So you see, there is no need for the connection language because you're always related. So we're never searching for something that we know is, is actually here. So it's in, within a cha, cha. So it's the beginning of also the chante, which I, I have asked several elders, the chante, which means heart. Because, and, and they came up with saying that chante is, is the uh, tree-ing, um, living. So chante for us is, our hearts are, chante is tree-ing, living because it has the same motion, we have a heartbeat. And I know Suzanne might have already said that uh, the trees have a heartbeat also. So this language, these languages of indigenous or um, our, our, our understanding we are born with somehow, but somehow we've, we've uh, overthought our living capacity with the earth, <laughs> you know? And so we have a different view from outside rather than those folks who are, are been living and thinking outside of that box of concepts. So, you know, I think that I, that can explain without confusing more. Um, that's what I have for you. That's great. That's great. Well, since you mentioned out of the box thinkers, um, I definitely would like to introduce my dear friend, uh, Paul Stamets. You know, we met 13 years ago at Bioneers, showed him some of my time-lapse mushrooms, um, and then we bonded. And um, we, I think, are a wonderful example of scientists and artists working together, exploring that sense of wonder and curiosity. As, as you were just saying, Teokasin, it's what we were born with. And we sometimes forget is that oneness of being in the moment, of having wonder. Of, of, of curiosity. When you're in that moment, it's when you feel gratitude. Um, you know, Paul has been a, uh, a courageous eco-warrior. Um, I'm so honored to, have, to be his friend. He reminds me all the time we're brothers because we're the, uh, the mother, I mean, mycelium is a mother of us all, so I guess we're related. But uh, I am honored to have made a film with him. It took about 13 years of um, uh, patience, trials, tribulations, and the mycelium network and the mushrooms decided this was the perfect moment for it to be released. And we are building mycelial networks globally. So Paul, um, you know, nature's intelligence is something I think you have spent your life trying to unveil and share the mysteries with us. So um, share what you want to share in conjunction with what we just heard from Suzanne and Teokasen. Well, Teokasen, good to see you again, brother. Um, <laughs> and Suzanne and Jay, um, also honored, and Louis. Yeah, it's been a very a dance, a dance of souls uh, around the same uh, melody of nature. Um, well, I, I want to sort of, you know, this, this concept of the intelligence of nature reminds me of a, of a debate I had with my older brother, Bill. Um, he's very intellectual. He's way smarter than me. But he edited my book, Mycelium Running, um, painfully, uh, sentence by sentence. And when I just started to describe the intelligence of nature and mycelium, he scoffed at that. He goes, I mean, you, know, you how can you say such a thing? And I was, you know, greatly challenged. I'm trying to come up with example after example. And then I had an epiphany. And I said, okay, Bill, will you concede that you are a natural organism? Yes. Well, that means that nature ultimately gave you birth. And he goes, yes. And I said, and you consider yourself to be a fairly intelligent person. And he goes, yes. So I, have, I, I had to go down a logic tree with him to kind of entrap them with this idea. And I said, do you understand the absurdity of your challenge that nature cannot be intelligent when you are using the brain cells that nature gave you to conceive the concept to object that nature is intelligent? I mean, end of argument in a sense. <laughs> so, but but uh, but no, it re more realistic, you know, on sort of a down to earth. Um, what Teokasen said about uh, the, the earth breathing and whatnot, um, from a science scientific point of view, uh, which I think is also an indigenous point of view, I see the convergence of science and spirituality 
really for the first time in, in eons, um, that science is authenticating much of the indigenous knowledge that has been resident. We're just using different words, different, different ways of explaining the same universal truth. Fungi gave birth to animals about 650 million years ago. The mycelium chose the route of digesting its nutrients externally, and uh, our animal um, you know, ancestors and circulated nutrients in a cellular sac and digested nutrients internally. The fungi went underground, the animals more or less went overground, developed cellular sacs and layers of protection from the elements. The mycelium is totally exposed. But the mycelium is not only digesting nutrients externally, like an externalized stomach, um, but they're also um, inhaling oxygen, exhaling carbon dioxide, so they're like externalized lungs. So the idea that Earth is breathing it may be seem like a first indigenous people's metaphor to us, not you know, not of that culture, but from a scientific point of view, that's actually academically accurate and defensible, and it makes a lot of sense. When we are losing the carbon in the soil, fungi create soil, but when you cut down the trees, the fungi can't build the soil. And when you thin and rob the carbon bank, you're reducing the ability of the mycelial networks to breathe and to be able to break down, you know, sure. you're robbing the menu of trees and wood, you're inhibiting their digestive cycles. So these are not like externalized stomachs and lungs, but now we know they're actually our communication networks, the work of, of Suzanne Samard and others. And there's an interesting series of, of articles that have come out in the Journal of Nanobiology. Um, and this is, there's uh, numerous articles that have been published. And what's really interesting about some of these fungal networks is they, they digest rocks. They actually munch rocks. They break them down and the minerals then are released and up, uh, by the mycelium to the benefit of plants. But further looking at the, it's called the mineralization of rocks by fungi, but they have several species, or species have unique talents for hyperaccumulating certain metals. And silver nanoparticles in particular have been a focus of some of the research by nanobiologists because the ability of the mycelium to selectively pull out these conductive metals gives them the, uh, not only antimicrobial properties, many people know that uh, silver is a, is, is a good antimicrobial, um, protecting against bacteria, but they also allow for the transmission of signals. Um, so these cellular networks are living external brains, I believe. They're sentient. As you walk through the ecosystem and every foot that you step that you take, you're le not only leaving a depression, you're leaving an impression. And nature is aware that you are there. And so I like to say, you know, and I've said this in the movie more or less, that irrespective if you're a doctor diagnosing a patient that's sick from a virus, or if you're an indigenous shaman who believes the patient is has a disease from the spirit world, they both hold in common that disease can be caused by the invisible. But the modality of their diagnosis is actually very similar. We have this you know, I spent many years as a scanning electron microscopist, but we're limited by our vision. You know, just the mechanics of our, our ability to see things. And what I think, you know, particularly from my experience of the psilocybin mushrooms and sacred medicines, that our vision is increased. And we're able to see nature in so many more of its elegant forms. And I know this about nature's intelligence, but now the research on psilocybin causing neurogenesis that increases intelligence, increases the ability of brains to, to, to regrow, to be able to overcome PTSD, alcoholism, uh, tobacco. 25 universities in the United States have been approved by the FDA for psilocybin and psychedelic uh, medicine therapy because they are so effective. They're effective, I think, because they're able to reprogram our brains and stimulate new synaptic junctions that lead to more creativity, that lead to happiness. Um, if you're happier, you're more creative. If you're more creative, you're happier. So I, I think that we're kind of at the fork roads in our evolution. And what I would like to see is a further investment in understanding that science and spirituality are not in opposition, that we are in a continuum of knowledge together 
our, our language and our choices of words may be different, but we're on the same path. And as we walk through this path in nature, we're not only awakening the microorganisms underneath our feet, but the DNA trails that we emit, the signatures that we are leaving on the environment can be read by other organisms well after our passing. And they're communicating with us constantly. So I look forward to the day that we don't look at the world through a very, very thin lens that we're accustomed to. And indigenous peoples in particular, because they have kept their framework together far better than those of us have been dominated by Christianity from European backgrounds. Don't get me started. Um, but I just think that this is the time for us to open up our hearts and souls to, to the intelligence of nature because there's so much genomic knowledge in every single square inch of soil that we can harvest this knowledge that's evolved over the eons for the benefit of the survival of our communities. And, and um, this COVID virus is one example um, of nature rebelling against us for the trespasses that we have committed uh, against biodiversity. That's great. Yeah. Jay, um, I know your book is called A Force of Nature, but I think you are a force of nature. I remember the incredible invention you developed by putting a little tiny propeller at the bottom of these giant municipal water tanks in order to circulate the water to prevent algae instead of pouring in the you know, chemicals. And I think you were using the, this, the equivalent electrical power of a 60 watt bulb in order to do that. Um, the propeller design is, is just another beautiful example of biomimicry. The spiraling being nature's based, most efficient and elegant design for moving air and water. Um, we just got a, a question in which I think would be perfect for you, Jay, which is, um, this is from Chris James. Given that our neural pathways are in the same ilk as the mycelium network, and we are pretty much billions of cells all cohabitating in the body, could our brain be the most advanced species of fungi? <laughs> Jay, you want to try to tackle that? Or yeah, right. Very good. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, well, just a just a tiny background. Uh, yeah, before I address that, um, you know, I'm Australian, obviously, and uh, it's six in the morning here in Australia. I'm on the west coast. Australia is the most a ancient landmass on Earth. It's not only got the oldest culture, Aboriginal, sixty thousand years of continuous uh, habitation in Australia. Um, but the, the rocks are the oldest on Earth. The rainforest is the oldest on Earth. And it's a highly weathered and highly diverse uh, eco, set of ecosystems, everything from tropical rainforest to, to uh, tundra. And there's an enormous complexity and diversity in wildlife here. Um, you know, the songbirds of the world uh, came out of Australia. They evolved out of Australia. And you know, there's one little area not far from where I am that has, in a small area, has 2,000 different varieties of wildflowers. So there's extraordinary intelligence in the landscape here. And, and I grew up, I had the great fortune of growing up in that and seeing all of these uh, wonderful networks and, and these complexities and everything that, uh, uh, that we're talking about this morning of everything, um, um, in community and, and dependent on each other. And as a, I used to be a fisheries and wildlife officer for quite a few years in my youth and uh, spent a lot of time trying to protect ecosystems. And then for political expediency, for, to create jobs, to create wealth, um, entire reserves might be bulldozed by the likes of Alcoa, etc. And so this extraordinary diversity, this extraordinary network of life just got obliterated and reduced down to clay pans you know, with zero life. And uh, to me, that was absolutely shocking. And, and so that's why I, I moved into this, this career um, 
in the walking paths um, with uh, with you and and others and the biomimicry and the bioneers community. And uh, so, in terms of um, mycelium and the networks and uh, and our brains mimicking that, where I come from uh, is looking at really movement and how that everything in this universe is moving all the time. There's actually nothing that's stationary. Even the room that we're sitting in is spiraling through space at 137 miles a minute. So all of that movement, it turns out, shares and all of the movement in mycelium and all of the um, the firing in our brains, all of the networks we have are all moving constantly. And all of that movement happens to be in the shape of the whirlpool that's in the bathtub when we pull the plug. And every uh, physicist and, uh, on Earth knows that all movement in our universe is defined as turbulent. So there's no such thing as a, 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 a straight line. There's no straight movement. Everything is spiraling. All of that spiraling and turbulence is like a whirlpool in your bathtub. And what has absolutely fascinated me over my lifetime is that all of, if you imagine that all movement is little whirlpools, all of those whirlpools are intertwined it's like an absolute mass. There's no part of our universe that isn't full of these spiraling movements of energy. So it's like a solid block of energy, if you like, but it's all resonance, like we strike a bell. Well, the universe is like untold numbers of bells all ringing with a slightly different frequency. And those those resonances communicate with each other. There's no part of a whirlpool that isn't connected as far back as we can imagine and as far forward as we can imagine. So every single, even that whirlpool in our bathtub, if we looked at the streamlines of that whirlpool, it goes right back, infinitely far back and infinitely far forward. There is no separation. And every piece of information in a mycelium network or in our brains, every movement, every little electrical pulse is connected infinitely back and infinitely forward. Wow. <laughs> um, I've got a question for it. Tiokasen, um, if you could have a grove of elders to give a message to the people of Earth, who would you choose? And what is the most profound medicine uh, one is gifted? Well, the, the, to me, that's a typical question. Um, I think the, the elders that we're referring to is actually the elders of Earth, like the rock, the trees, the things that were here before humans. And so um, the the earth has no concepts because it's, it's too intelligent to have concepts, so to speak. Um, so when we were referring to these elders, um, if, if she's talking about human beings, I would refer to more anybody all over the world who was born with that understanding that they're in their speeches and their, in their language and their lexicon that, that they're speaking from the earth because that's where they are. They're not speaking for the earth or to the earth. And in a sense that they're worshiping Earth either. So you realize, like Paul referred to, that all of this consciousness, the elders, the rocks, the water, the trees, uh, the, the animals, all those elders were here. And they taught us this language. And when we understand that, there is really this, there is no council, so to speak, because we all have to be related. And when we go to the Western Way of thinking that we're all one we can't be one unless we learn how to relate like a forest of trees they have to relate they're not just one tree but yet they are and so when i understand what jay was talking about this little this little little spiral thing <laughs> you see that's that's a, and paul has one too so we're talking about the, the spiral of the universe the 
the how the universe turns as well as the brain and everything else that we have. So that's an elder teaching. That was one. Um, it, but the thing is, the difference is that we don't own, we don't own the knowledge. We only can recognize the understanding that these elders have. So if we're refer referring to humans, well, there's there's plenty around. I think we we have to learn how to. Uh, it, it's like Earth listens to us, but we are taught in this society go to go listen to the Earth, and that's kind of more. Um, uh, an arrogant benevolence, so to speak, if that's the right word to say, is that why aren't we going to the to the the forest to to learn how the earth is listening to us? You see, and I think that's a teaching from the earth itself, because that's where we say all our thoughts come from, our language, even the concepts that I'm speaking to you. That's great. Well, truly. I've heard you say, and, and it's always been true that it, it's all related, you know, yeah. that idea that you're right, that it's not just one, but it, but it's how we all interface with each other. It's the relationships. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a wonderful outtake. Hey, Justin, I'd love you to queue up. It's called Suzanne Samard, Shared Economy. This is an outtake from the movie. It's not in the movie. I know a lot of people are, very concerned about you know, the COVID-19, um, not only about the health risks, but about the economy. You know, how are we gonna get back to work and, and, and what's gonna happen uh, in terms of um, how are we gonna survive? And it's really, it's a great question about the reset, but I, I think there's a wonderful um, metaphorical parallel that Suzanne talked about that I would consider the ultimate example of nature's operating instructions that should be given to every economic class or MBA, uh, you know, studies at Harvard or at Yale. So Justin, could you play that clip? The economy of fungi and plants is really easy to think about it like our own marketplace. So there's an exchange and there's been new research on this. Someone who gives more gets more in return. So the plant that gives more carbon the fungus will give more phosphorus and nitrogen to that plant. It works both ways. So it's like a market economy. And human beings are the same. Like we have this tit for tat thing, right? You know, if you do um, me a favor, I'll do you a favor. It works perfectly in plants and fungi or mycorrhizas as well. So it's, it's easy for us to conceptualize. If you take more than your share, then you're not gonna get something back. And I think that the lesson for human beings is we have taken more than our share. So once we give back, we'll get it back from nature. Nature being a blueprint, uh, a roadmap for how we can, you know, live our, you know, social, political, cultural societies. Um, Paul, I want to ask you, um, you know, again, as an observer of nature, and, you know, I'm also an observer with my cameras doing, you know, slow-mo high-speed shots of pollinators and bees. Um, you've come up with a very interesting invention, you know, to potentially help save the bees. And um, I know in the course of making, you know, our movie, I was working on Wings of Life and always talking to you about, Paul, you're so smart. We got to figure out a way to like, you know, save the bees. Um, it's our food supply. I mean, many scientists agree that, you know, saving the bees is perhaps more critical than even climate change. So um, talk to me a little bit about the, uh, that effort and then we'll, we'll show the clip of the bee feeder. Well, Louis, actually you get a lot of credit for this because you inspired the idea. Um, you kind of planted a spore in my brain, uh, so to speak. Uh, that's a good thing, by the way. What, did um, a cordyceps pop out? No, not really. But so I had about four events in my life that, you know, you have to string these together and they're pretty improbable, but. I'm a, obviously a mycologist, I grow fungi. I had a garden giant bed in my backyard in the late 1970s. And, and I, one day this garden giant bed of mycelium about this thick, I went out to my garden in July and I had two beehives about 500, 800 feet away. And I, I, I went to water my mycelium and it was covered with bees. And I go, that's really weird. It's July, there's lots of flowers and pollen around. And, and then I noticed 
there's about 50 to 100 bees every day, all day long, from morning to dusk. There was a convoy of bees going from my beehives to my garden giant mycelium. And it literally sucked down the mycelium to about one fourth of its depth. Well, I wrote about this and I put it in one of my books and published it in Harris Smith Magazine, one of my books in 1999. Um, and I kind of forgot about it. And then I got involved with the BioShield Biodefense Program, Project BioShield, found that these polypore mushrooms can help upregulate immunity to reduce viruses. And lots of my TED Talks and TED Med Talks, you know, talk about that discovery. Um, and then we went forward and then I met you and you were sitting, telling me the bees are really in trouble. And Paul, can't you do something to help them? And you were talking about buffers you know, along streams and around fields. And I go, well, Louis, the reason why those work, you know, I, is because the debris fields are feeding mycelium. And so that's helping nurture that ecosystem for a diverse flora, you know, pollinating plants. And then that's when I went to bed and then I had this waking dream. Um, Louis said, what can you do to help the bees? And I went, oh my God, my bees went to my mushroom patch the BioShield program showed that these polypore mushrooms reduce viruses that harm birds, swine, or pigs, people. What if these extracts also from the mycelium of these wood decomposing mushrooms help bees? So I had this epiphany. I got a hold of Washington State University, and um, we started doing research over the past five years. Um, I'm happy to say that we published in Nature uh, scientific reports. We're still today in the top 1% of all articles ever published in the nature publication ecosystem. Now, for those people who are not familiar with nature, some of the most prestigious uh, series of journals, scientific journals in the world, only about 7% of the articles get published. And we found that our polypore mushrooms that grow in, in, in rotting trees um, reduces the viruses that harm bees, and in one case, the Lake Sinai virus, 45,000 to one with one treatment in 12 days of these extracts being put in the sugar water, which most all honey, uh, commercial honey producers use. And moreover, it reduced the deformed wing virus by hundreds of times. This is important because bees used to fly nine days, pollinating about a thousand flowers a day. Now they're only flying for about four days. So pollination services from honeybees have been reduced. And the viruses now have spread from honeybees into all wild bees. So all bees in the world now are infected with these viruses. So this was a breakthrough. And Louis, is the convergence of science, you know, and, and, and art coming together. And I like to reflect on, I'm an amateur astronomer, to see the artists, just uh, uh, paintings of new planets, and new, new solar systems. I mean, that's an example also of artists and scientists working together. So when we can vision through whatever means, artistic expression, then we can then use that information as a new increased language of ideas to be able to implement. Because we have to be able to envision it or imagine it before oftentimes we can act upon the idea. So artists are idea generators and scientists then take the ball from there. And it's a, it's a, you know, it's a circular relationship. So I come up with a citizen scientist bee feeder that we're trying to we're giving these away um we have a problem because of covid night not now the manufacturer can't supply them but i think there's a little video you want to show is that is that correct yeah well i i think it's the right one but either way it's either from the movie where you're helping the bees uh yeah. let's, let's show it justin these very same mushrooms have a collateral benefit across many species of animals Over the last decade, honeybee populations worldwide have declined drastically. Beekeepers and scientists have been working to try to find out what's the cause of this decline. So what you're seeing in here is a super common issue for beekeepers. This colony has been destroyed by Varroa. There's all these dead larvae in here that will never become adult bees and never contribute. We've experienced quite a few losses of colonies related to Varroa mites. Right here is a sick bee. You can see her wings are deformed. Uh, this is a symptom of Roa and a virus called deformed wing virus. 
by far the number one cause of colony losses are attributable to varroa mites and those viruses they vector and everything else. Honeybees are the most important pollinators for agriculture. Approximately a third of the crops grown rely on cross-pollination to thrive. We're in these beautiful almond orchards, one of the most bee-dependent crops in the world. Now, unfortunately, we're losing bees across the world in a dramatic die-off that is very dangerous for the biosecurity of this planet. And this is going to affect worldwide food biosecurity. In 1984, I was growing mycelium in my garden, and I had two beehives. And I noticed in the summertime, there's a continuous convoy of bees going from my beehives to my mycelium. I looked very closely, and the bees were sipping on the sugar-rich exudates, little sweat drops coming from the mycelium. And this idea rested with me for 30 years. My epiphanies don't come very quickly. <laughs> but then it dawned on me, but well, maybe the bees are benefiting from the mycelial extracts because they have antiviral properties. So I started exploring this and soon discovered that fungi that infect insects, which are not infectious against bees. And so I cultured the most aggressive strains and then submitted them. We started testing the effects of these extracts in helping bees survive. Preliminary experiments are showing that some of these fungal extracts are really good at reducing viral levels in the bee. So here we have a fungus that is helping fight viruses in an insect. What I really think is the bigger picture here is that the same mushrooms that reduce viruses in bees also reduce viruses in birds, pigs, and humans. The entire ecosystem is infused with fungi. Habitats and humans share immune systems, and mushroom mycelium is the cellular bridges that knit the two together. You know, one of the things we were talking about earlier is this narrow view that, you know, Western society has about nature. I think one of the things that I've been doing my entire life for 40 years, I've had cameras going 24 hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop, filming time lapse of plants, flowers, mushrooms. I've squeezed all that into 20 hours of film. So that, that's sort of a God's eye view of nature or as a redwood tree would look at nature. Um, and what we were talking about earlier too, about that magical intersection between art and science. You know, Jay, I want to ask you a question because when I was shooting like the monarch butterflies, for example, in Mexico, and I was doing, you know, I was filming at a thousand frames per second, these close-ups of the butterflies in slow motion. And the scientists, you know, the monarch scientist experts were just blown away because it looks like they just flutter, you know? but they actually, their wings bend. They saw the fact that they bend and there's like an aerofoil, you know, dynamic that I think you could explain better than I could, but they had never seen it before. Mm. So could you perhaps just share with us, I mean, what is the essence of biomimicry, you know, in, in terms of having this open-minded terra incognita perspective of nature and how that potentially is helpful for, for the human, for human species. So uh, <clears throat> to try and put that into just a few words, <laughs> uh, really, you know, the modern age of science has only been around about 300 years. And we've done a lot of experimentation. It's into billions. We've spent trillions of dollars on research. But nature's been experimenting a lot longer with a much, 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 much bigger budget. And Every step of nature's way is life and death. It's all about survival. So nature has evolved systems that are the absolute optimum in minimizing the use of energy, minimizing the use of materials, maximizing the probability of life, and supporting all of the life systems on Earth. So nature doesn't destroy for no purpose. And everything is communicating with each other and supporting each other, as you're clearly demonstrating. And so biomimicry is really saying, well, look, nature's been doing this for a very long time. What can we learn from that? 
And there are so many things. I mean, pretty much everything that we do today is being learned from nature, whether it's how an aircraft flies. You know, that Australian Aboriginal boomerang is a perfect aerofoil. You can't do a better aerofoil. And that's obviously been taken from looking at things in nature, right? They didn't have supercomputers. And so we see over and over, even brewing, you know, uh, um, paper making, um, paper wasp nests, uh, paper, you know. So nature has shown us all sorts of things. So now that we have this modern age and we're having incredible technologies for observing and looking deeply into what nature is doing, we can actually see in much more detail and refinement and we can transport that into modern technology. And my particular interest, or one of my particular interests, is that nature just uses a fraction of the energy that we use as humans. And if we were able to change over the industrial world to mimicking how nature conserves energy, we wouldn't lose anything we would still have all the functionality we want, but we would use at least three quarters less energy than we do today. That means three quarters less CO2 emissions. That means less climate change problems. That means less all sorts of problems. And that's there to be discovered. And not only is it there to be discovered, but a lot of these things are being discovered. And what we have, and this is all in the last 20, 30 years, and it's growing exponentially, it's, it's really the, the big issue is translating this into the industrial world and into the commercial world where people um, aren't just following the same train track into the future and doing the same old thing the same old way, but are willing to really look at this and embrace it and take it on. And, and that is happening. And, uh, and that's catching up. And we need that to catch up a lot faster to get in front of the, the really major intractable problems we have today. I love that. Uh, I always remember you saying, there's no such thing as a right angle in nature. Right. It's, yeah. It's quite yeah. true. Um, so uh, let me just go around. Is there any um, anything you guys want to share or say that you feel you haven't had a chance to really touch on regarding this incredible deep topic? Yeah, I well, think I don't think we've had a chance to touch on very much at all. I mean, we're having an expensive <laughs> I understand. About... <laughs> I know. Uh, with, within a limited scope of time and, and space. Um, no, Suzanne, uh, what would you like to say? Um, just that, you know, through my work, I've come around to um, really seeing in my scientific, very narrow way of looking at things um, that what what the Lakota have known for a long time, what the Haida have known for a long time, the Coast Salish, the, the Aboriginal people of the world is that we are all connected. We are all part of this earth. We are one with the earth. Um, all the creatures of the earth, all of our relations, we're all one. And the sep how we've separated ourselves from nature and looking from the outside in is where we've created a lot, a lot of problems. That from that arises climate change, from that arises this pandemic, is the separation of us from nature. And then, you know, allowing ourselves to become, you know, exploiting nature because we feel like it's not part of us, it's something to exploit. And once we can get back to our roots of us as human people, of, of being the, of kin with the earth, of kin with the trees, of kin with the rocks, that we are all one then we can start to heal ourselves because we're right now our view as from the outside is a damaged view. And because of, out of that has become a damage to the earth. This manifestation of the virus is a real wake up call to us to get back to what we are, that we are part of this one earth. Um, and it's only when we do that, will we solve problems like this. It's a, it's a wake up call, right? You know, we've had lots of warnings about pandemics, but also climate change, uh, loss of biodiversity, overpopulation. It's time for us to wake up, look at who we are. Where do, where are we in this? We are just part of this. We are one with the earth. When we embrace that, we'll be able to solve these problems. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Wow. Tiokasin, um, 
as, as a sort of like a spiritual capper to what Suzanne just said, um, I love hearing, you know, your point of view. You know, we talk about, you know, like God, you probably don't even have a concept of God, you know, which to most Western you know, cultures consider that to be the ultimate kind of spiritual place to be. I think I've used my camera more as a spiritual seeker than a filmmaker, you know, slowing things down, speeding things up, you know, zooming in, zooming out. I just want to step outside of that narrow confine of vision as Suzanne eloquently expressed that we are one with it all. And I'm just curious from your world, from your culture, um, just just share like what is what is the what is the great everything? <laughs> well, <laughs> and then do it do it in two minutes. <laughs> what, shall we say Santini? I don't know, but uh, so we say um, that. Let's begin this this short little minute or so of explanation. Is yeah. uh, there in, in there's there's no word or concept for domination in Lakota. So you're speaking a language of relationship to everything, seen, unseen, that you can touch, that, that you think is has nothing because you think it's dead. Um, so when I when I think about domination, I think about are we conscious enough to know that there's no such thing as conscience? Nature doesn't have a conscience; it has consciousness, which is basically an awareness. So how do we define that awareness in a sense that um, without dogmatizing if that's what it is, a God who lives out there away from us or any monotheistic endeavor that human people have taken a little too far, I think, to separate us from this very essence of, of life that we it is. So a word that I sat in, in circles with Native people, because at one time in this country, it was against the law to for Native people to sit in circles, you see, because that was a sacred one a shape that could not be changed. Um, so when I think about the word that maybe you're thinking of is wakan, which is many meanings. One is to make the ability to make something live or die. But I think I was talking about that wakan essentially means to consciously apply mystery to everything. Mm. And that to you would be God, I guess, but not really conceptually because it's a moving, like like Jay said, everything is moving. Thus the language is, is just is with the movement in the continuum, in the invisible continuum of purity, if that's what it is. So you see every moment is innocent. It's not, there's no such thing as guilt. Every moment is innocent. And so that's how life is. It's always moving and blooming and Everything is always wonder. So you, you you evolve with the language of abundance rather than one of lacking. What are we missing here? Where did we come from? Where are we going? This is our goal. This is our, we have to solve mystery. So what intelligence in the Latin language, what intelligence means, it's neither cause or effect. Intelligent means, intelligence means, um, uh, essentially intelligence means in between the lines. So are we speaking the language in between the lines of cause and effect? You see, are we just continuing to be linear? So we're talking about the if effect, the mystery. So the, I, I see that the, the Western world is still trying to solve the mystery and the indigenous folks have accepted the mystery. And maybe that's why we're not going crazy. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's yeah. beautiful. That's really great. Okay. okay, well, um, um, I've got a, a little special surprise. Um, I met Rob Garza from Thievery Corporation uh, recently in San Francisco. Yeah. I told him what we were doing, and he uh, is going to come on. Uh, Justin, if you could have him join our conversation from San Francisco. Right on. Come on, and he's... Uh, joining our conversation here we go yeah he needs we don't need is he is rob are you here i need to find you there you are rob can you and see then, me uh, there you are dude how's it going man fantastic how are you we're doing great, great. join the tribe yeah i love this conversation it's so 
you know, eye opening and just it's what the world needs right now. You know, it's, yeah. Thank okay. you for having me and putting this all together. As we were saying earlier, we need art and music to lift our spirits. And in conjunction with science, it's, it's we're on the same path, you know? Yeah. It's to, uh, to be in the moment, to be filled with wonder, curiosity, and yeah. um, celebrating, you know, life in every way we can. So um, when I told you about what we were doing, I said, hey, do you happen to have a song that maybe relates to what we're talking about? And um, so um, I think miraculously, you've got created a virtual band <laughs> yeah. all around the world. Yeah. And uh, this is gonna be a premier event. Yeah. So um, who needs celebrities? We have each other. And um, so here's your yes. intro. So this song is, uh, it's called Where the Moon Hides and I have another project called Garza. I'm sure everyone knows me from Thievery, but I'm doing some other music as well. And this song is about like, being able to see that tr transcendent, eternal, interconnected quality in each other and everything. And, uh, you know, I'm really happy and proud to be a part of this. And I think you told me also earlier that, you know, growing up, um, I think your dad was like, you know, inspired you with Beatle music as well as um, psychedelic yeah. journeys. So it's had a good well, influence that's... on your life. Not really, but not, he, he would, he would be working on stuff uh, during the weekends and the Beatles would come on and he would be like, this is when the Beatles took psychedelics. And I was about oh. 12 years old and I would be like, I want to do psychedelics. And so that's always been a part of my musical journey since I was uh, a young guy. And, uh, you know, just uh, bringing music, art, science, all of these things together. That's great. Wow. Like an app is really well. So what we're going to do now is we're going to play the, we're going to play the video that you created for us. Yeah. Thank you. So, really, so really I, appreciate. Yeah, I couldn't do it live because of uh, you know technical issues, but yeah. uh, as, yeah. <laughs> so this is the next best thing, best thing. So I put this together for you guys. No, anyway. that's great. And 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 after this, um, I just want people to know that. We've got some gorgeous, you know, moving art imagery that's going to follow it, and we're going to close our fungi day at you know 5 p.m. with a women psychedelic leaders panel conversation, which should be extraordinary. Um, again, the feminine point of view is what we need now more than ever when it comes to Mother Nature. Uh, probably have a lot less war, conflict on our planet. We had women leading it. And um, so, uh, so Justin, let's uh, roll the video, and um, and thank you, Rob, for doing this, and thank you for being part of the uh, Fungi yeah. Tribe. Thank all of you guys. I love that whole day. So thanks.
Welcome back, everybody, um, to Nature's Intelligence. Although for me, this was a uh, this was better than in any spiritual religious ceremony I've ever been to. Um, <laughs> if church was like this, I'd go every day because when when you hear the truth and it touches the deepest part of your soul, it feels so good. It feels really good, and I think that's what we we desperately need now more than ever. That that sense of truth, authenticity, honesty. And I know all of us, we find it in nature. Where else are we gonna find it, you know? I mean, you know, Teokishin, I mean, you, you so beautifully expressed the fact that it, you know, it's everywhere. We just, there's no I, me, us. It's about connecting with everything and, and being conscious of that. So um, I wanna thank, you know, all of you guys, Suzanne, Jay, Paul, Teokasen and, and Rob for, um, you know, creating this little communal circle. It's, it's still, it's legal for us to be in the circle, thank God. Um, and we will continue to be the, the changers, you know, the revolutionaries, the rebels. And um, I want everyone to like, you know, stay on the stream because we got a mushroom mashup, which is me um, putting all my time-lapse mushrooms into a mandala and letting the motion of that take you on your own journey. I know Paul is always proud of saying nature provides, I don't. I like to say I provide as well. <laughs> I provide nature. And um, so enjoy the journey. And this is really gonna be the highlight of the day, a conversation, all women panel talking about psychedelics, talking about the feminine, view of nature, talking about how we need to reconnect with rebirth, regeneration, nurturing, basically the thing that makes the world go round, you know, appreciating all the little things in life, how life is regenerated. Um, and I think that this is going to be a powerful, powerful conversation. So um, thank you all for being part of this giant mycelial uh, network. We continue to grow. I love seeing the spiral. Thank you. Um, I love everything you had to say, Jay, about efficiency. You know, that's nature's operating instructions. And all of you are leaders in your own domain. And bless, bless you all for, for being the changers on our planet when we need it now more than ever. Thank you. Thanks, Louis. Thanks, Louis. All right. Here. We've woken up to a new reality, and I'm happy to be connected to all of you. Everything is connected. What happens in China, New York, and Italy affects us all. Why do we have to suffer to recognize how connected we are? We can empower and enhance our connection by living in harmony with nature. Connection is all around us, everywhere. Networks of underground shared economies where ecosystems flourish without greed. Mycelium that can grow out even just this big can have trillions, literally trillions of end branchings. Almost everyone knows about the computer internet. The mycelium shares the same network design. When they're connected together and carbon is moving between plants, the trees are supporting the weaker ones. If she knows that there's pests around and that she's under danger, she will increase her competitive environment towards her own babies so that they regenerate further away. It's a magical thing. We found novel molecules highly active against pox viruses, novel molecules highly active against HPV, they have incredible capacity to make things change very, very quickly. So if we can work with them, if we get it, you know, if humans get it, we can change this thing really fast. So I am super hopeful. Nothing lives alone in nature. Communities survive better than individuals. Let's use our connection to Earth and to one another to preserve 
protect, feed, and grow. We need to have a paradigm shift in our consciousness. What will it take to achieve that? We are not an individual. We are a vast network. The interconnectedness of being is who we are.